All right, everyone. Um, we are going to now hear a talk from Stephen Kompal, uh, and he's going to tell us about abstract data types, specifically about how you can gain an advantage by adding additional type parameters to, uh, to your data types. Um, and it, it's in Haskell, right? Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, let's get going. Mm. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen Compel. I like to add type parameters to things. And uh, we're going to talk about Haskell, but I think most of what we're going to talk about will be applicable to the other fine languages represented at this conference, F Sharp, OCaml, Standard ML. Uh, so in most languages, there's one particular thing that you add to solve any kind of problem, right? So you know. In Java, what do you do to solve any kind of problem? You add a new subclass, right? Or like a singleton. Uh, in Common Lisp, you add a new optional keyword argument. And maybe you end up with 30 different optional keyword arguments on all of your functions, but that's okay. Well, kind of. Um, and in Haskell, you add a new type parameter to solve your problems. And the only kinds of problems that these solutions can't solve is obviously the problem of having too many of them. That hasn't really stopped Spring from adding too many subclasses. You can definitely, it hasn't really stopped uh, a lot of the types in the lens library from having six type parameters. Uh, but you, you, you can keep a handle on things. Use your best judgment. But what I want to focus on is that type parameters are not just about general purpose data structures. It's not about, well, lists need a type parameter, obviously. Well, arrays need a type parameter, obviously. Maps, obviously, need two type parameters, one for the key and one for the value. And Cleisley arrows need three type parameters, right? One for your monad, one for your input uh, type, and one for your output type. That's great general purpose data structures. They've all got type parameters. But I'm talking about the specific data types that you are writing for your application level code. This is not about libraries. This is about applications. It's about prosaic business logic style data structures. Even them, even they, can get a lot of benefit from adding a type parameter. So. Here's something that might show up in a few applications. We have a little representation web page here. And we've got you know, some of the stuff that goes into a web page. It's, it's probably got a URL where it came from. Uh, might have a title, maybe has a title. Uh, it maybe has a refer. If someone didn't type in the URL, they clicked on a link on some other page. Uh, just to add a little bit of, of excitement to the structure, we're going to have this list of links here. Uh, we just got a list of pairs of maybe the link text and then a URL where the link goes. And we have this little content here. Uh, the content is, I've new typed that out. And this is kind of how you would approach this, I think, if you were going for a precise unabstracted form of this data structure. You'd say when you first design your program, well, content is just a string. And I'm going to new type this out. And maybe I'll change it to something more exotic later, just depending on what I end up needing in my web page data structure. So I also have a, a couple of simple functions over this data structure. A little uh, setter for the with content. This is just sort of a primitive setter in lens speak. Uh, we take a content transformer function and yield a web page transformer function. And that's a pretty basic implementation. You have your f, which is your content transformer, takes in that and a web page. Uh, pulls the content out of the old web page, applies the function to it, and 
puts that new content back into the web page. And as with every transformer like this, you can derive a simple setter from it. And it's a little easier to focus on this setter, so that's what I'm going to be talking about most of the time. And this is just take a content, put it in your argument web page, and you get a result web page. So looking at the web page data structure, there are a lot of interesting places that you can add a type parameter. And the problem with trying to find the, the most interesting place to add a type parameter to a data structure like that is that there are so many choices. And as an application programmer, particularly if you're not used to adding type parameters to uh, business-specific data structures, uh, you may not even know where to start. I mean, there's nowhere obvious like when you're uh, building a sequence representation. The type parameter for a sequence representation is the element type, right? But there's nowhere that is definitely the right place to do it. But you don't have to find the right place to do it. You just have to find a useful place to do it. So the one I'm going to talk about here is just the simplest, silliest change that you can make to this data structure. And this is a kind of type parameter that I've used a couple of times. And I think it has some really interesting properties even though it looks utterly silly. And this is what it is. We add a new uh, B type parameter to web page. We get rid of that uh, reference to that content new type for content. And that field in this record type is just whatever that type parameter is. So that, that B didn't end up nested anywhere. Like, say, if we were talking about the types of links of uh, link URLs, it didn't end up uh, appearing in multiple places or in some kind of containing data structure. There's just one of them. There's exactly one of them. It's just one of the fields. That's it. And even something like this is somewhere that you can start, and you can start to get benefits from adding type parameters to things. So when we do this, <coughs> excuse me, when we add this type parameter, the inferred types of the with content and set content functions that we already wrote change a little bit. Now you have to throw out your handwritten type for these functions and see what gets inferred in order to see this in action. But that's just something that you'll end up doing when you're adding a type parameter and then going back over the functions that you've already written for that data structure. So in this case, uh, we're going to look a little bit at, uh, at with content later. But let's focus on set content for now. Set content has two type parameters, which is interesting because we only added one type parameter to web page. So why does set content have two type parameters? And in, in, in case it's not clear, the two type parameters here are A and B. So our B appears twice, first for our content argument, and then in our resulting web page, web page of B. And we have a second type parameter, which is A, and appears in the argument web page. Now, there's this whole thing with general recursion and seek that we're uh, just going to ignore right now, but someone looking at this type can tell that from the type alone, there's no need to look at documentation, that what this is doing is replacing the content. Because the A only appears in the argument, and it doesn't appear anywhere else. So the implication of this type signature is that the A must be thrown out, it, because it doesn't appear in the result. Uh, and that's all stuff about free theorems, and I'm going to try not to dig too much into the underlying theory there. This is a specific property of set content, right? You can tell just from the type signature that it's changing what's in content by the fact that there are two type parameters and you've got this A here that just disappears. But you can also tell when looking at functions that don't touch content that they don't touch content. So imagine a setter for the title. A setter for the title will have the same type parameter for your input web page and your output web page because you didn't supply new content, so it must be keeping the same content. 
And you can tell from the type signature alone, no documentation that is doing that correctly. What happens if this is your signature for set content, say? Uh, there are two possible things that you did wrong. So the first and most likely one, for a especially for a simple function like this, is that your handwritten type signature is wrong. And this is very easy to do in uh, Haskell. Uh, I think this is a little better in other languages uh, because they'll give you warnings and errors if the type signature that you've written isn't the most general type signature you could write for that function. Unfortunately, Haskell doesn't give you that, so you just have to sort of detect this uh, by looking at it. But this is a type signature that says, the implementation of set content cares what the old content of the web page was. So this is probably just you need to delete your set content and ask for the inferred type. If you do that and you end up with a type that looked like what we just saw with the two type parameters, great. You can just uh, throw this signature out and replace it with the new inferred type signature. That's one possibility. There's another possibility though, which is that the implementation of your set content function is somehow looking at the content in the old web page. Now, is that correct? Maybe. If what you meant by set content was for just throw out the old content, insert the new content, which is the first argument there, then yes, that's absolutely wrong. And you could tell that just by looking at the type. If what you meant was that you do some kind of merging of the two contents, maybe, then this isn't really a pure setter. And you need to be clear about that when you're describing in documentation and what have you, uh, what kind of function this is exactly. Now, I've been, that this is sort of what you do as a developer who's adding a type parameter to this web page data structure. But this sort of flips around when you are looking at this from the perspective of a user of this function. Right, you're a user, you're not familiar with the library, you're looking at uh, its signatures, its documentation for public functions, uh, the types of the public functions. As a reader of Haddox, you can look at the signature alone for this function and say, well, this is not a pure setter because you don't have those two type parameters that appear there. And you can start to make lots of mental shortcuts uh, based on this, where you don't, e you don't even have to notice what's in the documentation at all. You can say, well, this is obviously doing something magical with the content in the input web page because the type content appears in the input web page and it's not just a type parameter. So, we can also use this technique when we're talking about functions that have nothing to do with content, right? Hypothetically. So suppose you, supposing you have some kind of function for fetching all the links, and this is just an, a simple version of what a type signature for that might be. We're using the IO monad, and maybe you should be using some sort of some sort of uh, operational algebra that you've lifted into the free monad instead. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, let's say you can take a web page of any content, it doesn't matter what it is, and you scan over that links field, which is this list of URLs, and it gives you back this list of new web pages that were fetched in IO. So if you're saying, that all you're doing is looking at the links in your input web page, then this is the type signature that should be inferred. You have, this, you have this B which has no other references here. And it means this function did not look at the content. Which if you say you only look at the links, then you should only be looking at the links. Now is that right? Well maybe. If you're only looking at links, this is the wrong type signature. We have a string in the input a web page. That means that either we've handwritten a wrong type signature or we're looking at the string in some way. 
Now, if you're only supposed to be looking at the links to implement this function, then and your inferred signature says, well, you're looking at the content as well. Well, that, that's, that's not right. That's not what you said you were doing. But maybe that's not what you meant at all. Maybe what you meant by fetch links is, you know what, I'm going to scan the content, I'm going to find the links from there, I'm just going to ignore that, that silly links field, and I'm going to fetch the links according to what's in the content. And that's fine, if that's what you mean, right? So, the difference here is that we've taken what seems to be a precise, unabstracted specification of web page, and by, by abstracting it, we've made the type signatures of our functions much more precise because we can tell a lot about what they're doing with the content field just by looking at what these signatures are. So one thing we can do is not have any content at all. And this happens, right? Uh, before you fetch a web page, if you're implementing a web browser, for example, maybe you have this notion of a web page in your web browser, but you don't have content for it yet. So this is something that happens every day. Now, your alternate uh, form of implementing this idea, you have an idea of a web page that can either have content in it or it can have no content in it, is to use maybe. And that's great for some circumstances, but it means that the notion of whether a web page has content in it is utterly dynamic. You can easily end up with cases where you're calling functions that expect web pages filled with content that don't have content, or where you're calling functions that expect web pages that don't have any content to be filled with content. Because the difference between nothing and just isn't a type level difference, it's a value level difference. So that's not type checked. You need to test for that. But if you have two separate types for web pages filled with content and web pages that have no content, then you can say which one you mean exactly in your type signature. And that's what this is. We have a web page of unit. You ask for its content, it's just unit in it. If you like, you can, you can use our setter, our set content that, we, that we've already defined to replace that unit with something else, right? As soon as you fetch some content. Nah. There, uh, now, this is a little more Haskell specific than everything else that I've talked about so far because it has to do with type classes. Um, when you implement the, the higher, when you add a type parameter like B to a data structure, you start to get access to a lot of the higher kind of type classes, such as functor, foldable, and traversable specifically. I think functor, foldable, traversable are the most general purpose, the most prosaic, the most likely that you'll want to, to add to your data structures. Uh, it comes up the most often. Implementing these three, type, uh, these three type classes, or rather deriving them, because all of them, are, all of them tend to be derivable automatically in Haskell, well, in GHC, that is. Uh, and when you derive them, you get a whole slew of class methods and functions that are written for those type classes. Uh, so here, our with content and set content are existing methods on, on functor. And one way that you can tell when you're adding a type parameter uh, which type classes you should derive is you can take a look at your existing functions, look at their type signatures, and, well, uh, their, their new type signatures that you've, re, that you've uh, re inferred after adding the new type parameter, and say, well, what does this look like? So with content, we've got A to B to web page A to web page B. Well, that, that's like a map, right? That, that is F map, where F equals web page. So that says, well, with content, if we derive functor for web page, then with content is just F map. Now, now, with content is not a very complicated function. And the same is true of set content. So set content, we have B to web page A to web page B. If you look at the signature for the other class method of functor, less than dollar, uh, which is A to F of B to F of A, just do some alpha renaming on your uh, type variables there, and you end up with the same signature where F equals web page. So that gives you those functions for free. 
And there are some other functions you can get for free, and maybe you want some of them, maybe you don't want some of them, like this one. Of course, the length of a web page B is one. Exactly. It's always one. I, that makes me happy. I, th I think there are, there are a lot of people who are not too happy about that. Um, but thems the breaks. Maybe you can add some, some more contents in there, and you can end up with a, with a, con with a length of two for that web page. Hmm. Um, incidentally, this, this is where a lot of the more interesting ones come from. When you get to, when you get to traversable, uh, there are just so many things there that you get for free out of that. So we saw a basic setter already, but if you want something that's more akin, that's closer to a full lens for that content field for free, then you can almost get there by deriving traversable instead of functor. Not quite, but almost. And for a lot of, for a lot of cases, that's, a, that's enough. You don't need a full lens. You, you just need a traversal, and that's just fine. And length is just one thing. Just never call length. What do you need that for? All right, this is also a little type class oriented. But it gets more to the matter of how being abstract makes you lazy. I, I first discovered this when I was doing some uh, deriving of the generic type class. But we're going to talk about serial instead, which is a little more prosaic. Um, if you're not using SIB, then you're more, probably more likely to encounter in your program, particularly this one. As we know, there's no generally accepted way of exchanging web pages over a network medium or in storage. So obviously, we're just going to have to derive some sort of binary serialization mechanism. The specific one that you should always choose, of course, is the serial type class from the bytes package on Haskell. Uh, on, hack, on hackage, sorry. Uh, so when you, when you derive serial web page, you, ne you need like a serialization command for each of your component fields that you're talking about. So you need one branch for each of your data structures in both directions, serialization and deserialization. And you need one little element of that serializer for each field that you have, right? So no matter how you do it, if you have a serial web page, a serial type instance for web page, that is our original web page, you need one for your content as well. Now, uh, you say, OK, well, content is just a string, right? That's what it's new typed out as. But it, it adds a hard dependency. And this applies to all of your other functions as well. The definition of web page is dependent on the definition of content. Now, if we add this type parameter, though, Something else happens, right? We can say in the definition of our uh, serial instance for web page that, oh, it's just dependent on whether the serial for that type parameter is. Thus, the instance for content doesn't have to exist at this time. We can be lazy about it. The definition of the serial web page instance no longer depends on the serial instance for content. And this is true of all your other functions as well. So in this case, maybe we want to do some testing on our serial instance for web page. Because you, know, you want to make sure that when you transmit our, a web page using the only available medium for transmitting web pages over the network, you want to make sure that works, right? That's a testing matter. So you test out web page of bool, right? Now, bool has a well-defined, very simple binary representation. It's already written for you. You can go ahead and write out your instance for web page and test it with something concrete like bool that's just nonsense in your actual program. But it's just fine for testing purposes. You just substitute in something simpler. And it decouples the idea of testing your serial instance for web page from the idea of testing your serial instance for content. And this applies to all your other functions as well. The idea of testing your type parameterized functions for web page is an utterly separate notion from testing your type parameterized, uh, from testing your, that is, your uh, functions over content.
So, you know, there are like uh, GitHub issues or pull requests and mailing list discussions that tend to run to about 50 posts where people are discussing which is the best string representation to use, right? Uh, if you're maintaining something like this, it could very easily happen, right? What's the best representation of content to use in your data structure? Well, now I don't care anymore. I made, I made a type parameter out of it. You can just decide later. You can even change it over the course of your program. That's fine. And it's the same thing for something like uh, what type of sequence to use. Now, th this, is, this is something that's a little more boilerplate to do in uh, one of the other very fine languages at this conference. So this is, this is a little more Haskell specific. But you can take something like this and just say, well, I don't care about whether it's a strict seek or a lazy seek or, or what have you. I just have a higher kind of type parameter here, which represents what a linked list is, right? So at this point, we just substitute in list, which is written as brackets, for our original list type. And we can use that in simple cases. Maybe we can use something a little more exotic, like seek, uh, for whatever reason you can come up with. So as your, as your data structure moves through different parts of your program, it's not just that you can be lazy about making decisions about what should be the representation for strings or lists or what have you. It's that you can be lazy to the point where you're being latent. That is, the decision about the proper representation of content for this web page is not so much a function of defining this data type. It's a function of the functions that are written over the data type. So you, we start out, we have a, our simple web page. Uh, we've used the unit-based technique that I've already talked about to say, well, this is a web page. Here, this first line here, web page of constant unit and unit. Uh, this doesn't have any links list. It doesn't have any content at all because we don't have it yet. All right? And that's phase one. So your, a web page starts out life that way. So we have some medium. Maybe we use, I don't know, we could use some sort of computer network to fetch a web page. And now we have some content. We have some unstructured content. So we're just going to save it as a string. We still don't have a links list because we didn't figure out a way to derive that yet, right? So we, f we took our web page. We fetched its content. We got a string. We just put it in the content field. Our type changed. We now have a web page that still doesn't have a links list, but it has unstructured content in it. Now we moved on, and we need a links list. So we need to go ahead and figure out how to get that links list, right? So we're going to fill that in here with, these, with list. Now we have brackets. Now we have a proper links list. But there's something else that we did, too, when we were writing this function to fill in the links list. And that's that we parsed that body. Now, parsing can be expensive, right? Maybe you don't want to do it twice. So if we're going to go through the bother of parsing our unstructured string in order to figure out the links in it, then why are we throwing out that information? Why were we throwing out that information? Because the data type the precise version of the data type locked us down into that particular representation. It said, well, we've got a list of links, but we've got an unstructured content body. Every time that we need to get a structured content body out of that web page, we just have to reparse it. And that's a bug for sure. Maybe the solution from an untyped parameterized perspective is, OK, we're going to change this to a structured form. Every time we build a web page, we're always going to structure the content. Every time. We have to, because we only get one possible choice for how we represent content then. But in this case, we figured, we discovered it. We discovered our problem. When we were writing the function to figure out what the links list is, and all we had to do was substitute in another value for that type parameter. DOM, maybe, or something else. I don't know what the cool way to represent web pages is these days, honestly. 
I just make up pretend data structures and add type parameters to them. Right? You can, the functions that you're writing are type changing maps. You're taking in a web page with some type parameters and based on the needs of your, of your program at a particular time, sometimes you need unstructured data, sometimes you need more structured data. Sometimes you don't need any data. Sometimes you don't need data constructors. You can use an empty data type for that. Uh, I mean, you, you have something like functor. You can always add other mapping functions that just set a field, right? So just, just map to what you need. That, that's all it is. And that's, that's all I have for you. So any questions? Great talk, thank you. Uh, one interesting thing that you, you didn't say about abstracting out the type of the links is that you could build a tree. So you could follow all of those links uh, and get their sub links on those pages and all that sort of stuff as well. So having the, the structure of your links abstracted is, did you think about that? Is that something that you had tried? Uh, the way that I wanted, so, Specific, so what, do you, what uh, you're talking about specifically is, for example, free of list, right? So that's one possible representation you could use, just make a rose tree for your links. Yes, um, exactly. And that's really cool. You, if, you have like a, if you have a monad, you can do a monadic traversal and, and fill out a whole tree of, of, uh, of web pages from your links field. Um, the main reason I didn't do that was because I, I kind of went into a tar pit when I started to think about that. It became like, oh, well, okay, we should actually have four type parameters for this thing because we need to represent the type of referrers at the root of the tree and then the type of referrers at the, uh, you know. Right. But it is, definitely, it is definitely a pot, you know. Even with just this representation, you can just substitute free list, absolutely, yeah. Or co-free list, as the case may be. Go free? No, it's free. Okay. Anything else? Huh? Okay, I just wanted to note that one pattern I found useful in this vein was uh, sometimes when I make a record, I'll just have it take a higher type parameter, F, and I'll wrap every leaf field in, in an F. And doing that, you can use the same record you can have like an IO ref, ST ref, you can make LVARs, IVARs, whatever of your thing, and you get your original uh, thing back by using identity, which is a little awkward, but it's the flexibility in some applications really makes up for it. Yeah, sure. Um, identity is really useful for that. I, I wish identity was a little more convenient to use in those situations. Uh, this is this is one of the, the the places where where Scala is a little bit less boilerplatey. Unfortunately, it makes up for the boilerplate all over the the place oh. else. <laughs> um, but that that is, that is definitely very nice using different kinds of vars, especially different kinds of vars that have like different kinds of concurrency semantics or what have you. And you can just make those decisions based on the concurrent. Uh, properties of different parts of your program, definitely. So I want to touch on what you said about, uh, you know, this type parameter explosion, and that's something you, that like I've, I've experienced. When you can say anything, you can say nothing. And like you just end up having like, you know, five, six, seven, eight type parameters for all the different variations. I was wondering, how do you, well, like, what strategies, if any, do you use to kind of constrain that in direct users for certain use? Well, Haskell makes this a little bit easier because the, the implications of not having type lambdas and uh, that, uh, so relatedly to not having type lambdas, that type aliases do not have kinds until they are fully um, 
uh, saturated. Uh, that's really useful because it gives you uh, this notion of coherence and improves your type inference a lot. But it also means that the benefits that you get from the first type parameter are vastly dim diminished by the time you get to the third. Now, so, so when we derive functor, that works great for that first type parameter, right? Uh, but you can't get any of those benefits for your third type parameter. I, I say third because the second one is actually really nice because you can put a monad transformer there. Um, if you're, do, if you're writing new types for monad transformers, you should usually add a second type parameter, uh, which represents the underlying monad. That can be really useful. Um, but that really helps because it vastly diminishes the returns. And you, you get diminished returns anyway. Like, you can, you can tell, you can get like, uh, you get trade-offs from each of the additional type parameters you add. Each new one has a, has a smaller benefit and a greater cost, I think. And other, other than recognizing that, that after that first one is not going to be nearly as cool for the later ones, or after that second one, actually, um, then you, you can pretty quickly get a sense of when well, okay, I should really have a high, a high benefit in order to add that third type parameter, definitely. Okay, or, well, I, I like, I like the, the ed threshold, which is four, so. Four, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, easy stab. Yeah, right, stab. Oh. <laughs> yeah, as soon as, you, as soon as you've gone beyond stab, then, then uh, you, you might be going a little too far, definitely. So functions, uh, when you define them, pattern matching has an underscore character you can use to uh, indicate that you're not using the variable at all. Would an underscore character make sense in type signatures, like a setter where you have A to web page B, or yeah, A to web page B to web page A? You could just have something like B to web page underscore to web page B. So that would, that would actually be very beneficial and is very beneficial in a language that uh, requires you to declare the scope of all your type parameters. So in Java or Scala, for example, uh, you always have to declare the scope of your type parameters, which can be pretty redundant. So a single use uh, type parameter in a position like you're describing in an argument position has an existential type equivalent, uh, which is basically the difference between curring and uncurring. You have a type parameter, which is a parameter, and you sort of curry it because existential types are just dependent pairs. So what you have in what you're describing is kind of a pair of a type that's unused and erased, and then a web page of that type, right? And that's really useful in when you have to say, for all, these are my type parameters. But I don't think it's really, it would really be that useful in Haskell uh, because you don't have to declare what your type parameters are. So there's not really any additional cost to saying well, it, it B seems, or A. It seems like the advantage would be that it's sort of explicit that you're not using a type. Instead of something ha someone having to look at the type signature and realize that it's implied that you're not using it. That's true. I, that that could be that could be really helpful for novices, um, especially. I mean, I mean, if you're if you're unfamiliar with like free theorems and such, which you know, let's let's be honest, um, <laughs> I'm not familiar with three free theorems. Who is? Uh, I think that might that that might be there uh, once we have partial type signatures. I don't I don't know much about partial type signatures, but I, I know I've wanted them before. Um, it's like where you only describe parts of the types of your functions. And that might be, what you're describing might be a specialization of that, I'm not sure. But if it is, then, then that feature would subsume what you're describing, definitely. All right, let's uh, give it up for Stephen. Thank you.